those brands that are in a more commodity type market um, tend to have to work harder to differentiate themselves. And so they're going to be more focused on what the customer is getting from, from the value the customer is getting. Um, brands that um, are, do not have that much comp competition or have uh, created um, a special niche for themselves uh, can sometimes rest on their laurels and really be focused on the value that they're getting. I will say this, the, um, those that are right now um, doing well are those that have a brand personality and see their customers as um, partners, students. Um, um, they're, they're really focused on making sure that the, the customer gets the value from their, um, from their products. Hello everyone and welcome to the CVO Live. We are uh, here with uh, the one and only Brian Massey. Hi Brian, how's it Hi. going? <laughs> it's going all right. How's it there? It's, uh, you know, we have some war over there down in North, but it's uh, otherwise things are, uh, things are okay. We're coping with the new reality. Every March, every two years, we, we have a new challenge. <laughs> well, <laughs> It's a fun part of the country, a fun part of the world. Yeah, and of the life as well. So um, uh, I have uh, I have to introduce you to our audience. So uh, just uh, just a few words to tell the audience how how great human being you are and uh, such a, uh, such a great professional. So Brian Massey is the founder of uh, Conversion Sciences. He is uh, uh, an author and also one of the best professionals in the CRO space. And today we're going to, to uh, address the topic of conversion rate optimization and customer value optimization uh, as well. So Brian, the first uh, question that I, uh, that I have for you is uh, to tell us how you, who you are, if that's, uh, and I know this is a very broad question, who you are and how you, you got into the optimization space in the first place if you take the down the memory lane. All right. Well, I was born. No, I won't go back that far. <laughs> uh, how about this? Uh, I'm a computer programmer by training who got into marketing and sales when I left college um, because I thought maybe I had more social skills than the average computer programmer. And um in the early 2000s, I got into marketing and I um, realized how complex communicating products was and I wanted to learn faster. So I actually uh, wrote my own little analytics package, um, primarily focused on um, email and land email landing pages. And um, then Google Analytics came along and made my little my little analytics package looked dumb. So um, that was kind of the beginning for me. Um, I, um, once I understood what you could do with data, how you could really design better and faster with data, um, I became a little bit shocked that not everybody saw this, that everybody was doing this. So I started blogging about it and I would stand on any street corner you could put me on to talk about it and um, eventually just said, well, I'm going to have to do this myself. So I started Conversion Sciences in 2007 and we have just been growing ever since. Um, it was, there was a long time of writing and blogging when no one was listening. Um, but uh, I think um in 2010, things really picked up. And then uh, the pandemic, I think, woke everybody up because 2021 for me really was the year of conversion optimization. It's when people started coming to us and instead of asking what we do and we, us having to explain why they needed conversion optimization, 
they really started coming to us and saying, we need conversion optimization and we know it. And I think it was so many people went online, um, especially in the e-commerce world. And um, with the increase in traffic, a lot of businesses did not see a, a pickup in online business. So they were like, what's going on here? Um, I think things also got competitive at the search engines, both the organic and, um, and paid ads. So uh, right now it is, uh, people get it. And um, I'm just really glad that um, we're going to be using data more and more as we design things that acquire new customers and, and get new customers back for longer and longer term relationships. So Brian, what I'm, uh, what I'm hearing is that after, I don't know, more than a decade of uh, CRO trying to, to, to evolve your perception is that finally 2021 was the moment when people uh, finally got it. Uh, and I'm actually glad to to hear it. Actually, we we are in the in the same broader broader industry, and uh, I do know for a fact that uh, there were a lot of voices telling uh, uh, a lot of uh, let's say misleading people towards believing that 68% uh, uplift uh, in just uh, three months uh, it's actually possible, uh, and. Uh, what I what I also see right now is that uh, once the, the the companies get the importance of optimization, and uh, I think they it A/B testing started with the email and then with the, the website. I think this is uh, evolving uh, into into something else. Uh, I, as you as you know, I'm a strong believer that uh, all the life cycle of the uh, customers should be optimized you know we should analyze all the touch points that the customer our customers are having with a company and we need to look at uh, look differently at the customer journey because uh, now that we know the principles of optimization we can apply them for the whole life cycle of the uh, of the customer and uh, my question for you is how do you see customer value optimization unfolding because that means shifting the focus from conversion rate as a metric, as a success metric, even though both of us know that conversion rate is not such a good and reliable metric to, to rely upon. And uh, how do you see this transition from conversion rate to customer lifetime value? Yeah, so um, I think that most companies that come to us are really focused on acquisition. So I think customer lifetime value optimization um, still has some, um, some growing to do or some spreading to do. The idea virus has to get into more heads. But the beauty is that the, the skills that you use on the acquisition side will inform the entire customer value lifecycle. So um, uh, a lot of our customers are really focused on I've got this traffic coming in from ads that I'm running. I've got this traffic coming in from organic and we want more of these people to either jump on our list or um, buy from us. Um, and as we, um, you know, as we talk about lifetime value right now, we tend to leave that as the job of the products. So um, what I mean by that is that, if we've got great products, if we've got great customer support, our customers are loving what we're what we're building, they're loving the services that we're delivering, then that's going to take care of customer lifetime value. And nothing could be further from the truth. So I think for, um, uh, for customer value optimization, I think there is some more education to go. But the skills are there, the tools are there, and um, you're adding to... Uh, the tools that are available. Um, so uh, it's, it, I think it's really just a matter of educating them. And it's, it's, it's so much easier, so much easier to, to get an existing customer to buy again. And when you have, as you grow your lifetime value of a customer, every acquisition becomes more valuable. Does that make sense? Instead of, yeah looking at um, acquisition ad, you know, along the lines of what the first transaction is, you're looking at every one of those acquisitions as uh, through the lens of the lifetime value. And at that point, it doesn't even matter what the value of that first transaction is because you know 
once you've gotten someone that you would, you know, they buy it something for $50, you actually know that over the course of a year or two, they're going to be worth $600 because of the additional services and products they're going to buy. And that's, we optimize, we try to optimize for long-term value. Um, and the only way to influence that is by looking at the entire journey. Yeah. What I think it's um, crucially to add over here, Brian, is that uh, in, in this process of customer value optimization, there are many, uh, many aspects which are neglected. I mean, the uplift in the customer lifetime value is uh, helping companies not only uh, have a b- better budget, but also to attract better talent. There are many uh, uh, things that are, let's say, neglected by companies which are not taking care about it because there are uh, entrepreneurs and companies that state something like, you know what, we want to be profitable from the first purchase. And that's that's okay. It's just that the competition is so high right now. And it's uh, so uh, hard to compete with companies that uh, raise money, they can afford to pay more to acquire a customer. They are making their the, the math, you know, because at the end of the day, it's math. It's you. You see that uh, a customer buys on average three point eight times, and uh, it worth three hundred and eighty dollars. But you are so stubborn that you want to be profitable from the first purchase, and then leave it like it is. That means you are not capturing market share as you can. From, uh, from the market and that means you will not be able to, to scale scale your company and uh, that's, that's the downside of not uh, taking care about uh, customer lifetime uh, value properly. Uh, I want to ask you something regarding uh, customer value optimization because you, you've said something uh, really really important over here about the process of customer value optimization. Is this process about improving the value? of the customer for the company or improving the value that the customers are getting from the companies? Yeah, so um, I would love to say that, of course, of course, it's about the value that the customer is getting from the company. Um, but, you know, in if I, if I was to be honest, in reality, um, there's a whole lot of focus. On, well, there's different kinds of brands. There are brands that are, um, that are really focused on profit margins, their own, you know, what they're getting from the customer. Um, and then there are brands that um, really have to differentiate. So I, those brands that are in a more commodity type market um, tend to have to work harder to differentiate themselves. And so they're going to be more focused on what the customer is getting from from the value the customer is getting. Um, brands that um, are, do not have that much comp- competition or have uh, created um, a special niche for themselves uh, can sometimes rest on their laurels and really be focused on the value that they're getting. I will say this, the um, those that are right now um, doing well are those that have a brand personality and see their customers as um, partners, students. Um, um, they're, they're really focused on making sure that the, the customer gets the value from their, um, from their products. And interestingly enough, one of, the, uh, one of the best strategies for building long-term customer value is to have a subscription program. Um, something as simple as Prime for an e-commerce site. Those custom, those brands that are focused on the customer can carry a subscription basis where the customer pays a, a small fee every year and they, uh, they get free shipping, they get discounts on some products, things like that. Those customers that are a member of that membership program have a much higher um, long-term value than the those that just buy, even if um, uh, even if they're in a similar market, like or they're a similar segment, they're similar customers. They're going to buy about as many times. Um, the uh, frequency and uh, average order value goes up for people who run a membership program. So I think if when you focus on the value that the customer gets, 
you uh, have more tools in your tool belt, like subscriptions, to um, to increase long term value and to really um, um, use all the strategies for customer value optimization, optimization that 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 you can use. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Brian, regarding the uh, something that you've just said, let's uh, let's unpack a bit this uh, this uh, subscription model because uh, you need data to model it, right? There are many uh, on a from from a theoretical standpoint, everyone gets it. yeah, you you have uh, you have a subscription, you can add some benefits, but those benefits are, are costing you money. For instance, we've made some research for some of our customers. It was uh, eight times more uh, expensive to, to give free shipping than to give free returns. However, in the minds of the customers with some surveys, they realized that free returns were actually more important perceived as a perceived value to, to get. So there are all these tricks that uh, can be made in order to understand how to craft a uh, uh, a model to to incentivize customers and to actually analyze from a data point, uh, data perspective, where you draw the line. What kind of uh, benefits can you give to customers, and how much should that subscription uh, uh, be? You know, cost for 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 the customers. I, I want to unpack a bit these uh, these things over here because. Uh, Many, many people think that customer value optimization is about bombarding people with emails once they've bought, bought first time and giving them the same discounts to everyone. But it's actually math behind it and you, you need to be data driven. And my, uh, I want to I wanna ask you something uh, regarding this, uh, these things over here. What kind of skills should a company have in order to nail customer value optimization for them? So what kind of skills should they have? Um, well, I think uh, number one, they have to be comfortable with data. They have to be comfortable with um, data in all of its forms. So um, if you're optimizing for customer lifetime value, you sit down at your desk in the morning and you say, hmm, what can I do today to improve the customer lifetime value. How, what can I do to optimize it? How can I make it better for my customers? How can I adjust pricing so that I do get, you know, I do want to, the more profit margin I have, the more I can share with my customer, right? The more I can do to, over the lifetime of our partnership uh, to do things. So I sit down and the first thing is I come up with some ideas and I need to go and say, well, I've got these five ideas that I just came up with. How do I go find some data that tells me I need to bother with any of them? So you, you hit on a couple of something. What if I just increased the, the cost of my membership? What if I um, took back free shipping and in my membership, I only offered um, um, free returns? Um, how would those things work? So you've got to be able to go and find some data around this. And um, most um, most business managers, uh, especially in the e-commerce world, are used to going to their back end and getting whatever data they can get from there. Being able to take that data, marry it to data that would be going into your uh, analytics database, Adobe Analytics or Google Analytics, uh, the most popular ones right now. Um, being able to marry those things together so you can begin to answer that question of which of these ideas is the best idea um, and then being able to design experiments around that. So, I mean, you had mentioned it just a few moments ago, how much should we charge for our subscription program? Um, we've, we can pretty easily set up a A-B test on the front end to acquire new subscribers. And I think you'll be su surprised by the elasticity of the price, how much more you can charge before you significantly reduce the subscription rates. And you can often counter that by communicating the, the value um, more clearly. Um, then on, uh, you know, as part of your ideas, one of the one of them might be, I should uh, send email more often. I should send email to let my prized customers know when we have specials, when we're having promotions, just to let them know what kind of products we have when we have new products. Um, so how do you go about 
you know, diving into your analytics and diving into your email service provider to provide, to see the data that says, well, yes, this is a, a valid strategy and we should go from sending once a week to sending once a day, something like that. So the skills, I think, number one, are data. Number two, being comfortable with um, the statistics around experimenting. So that you can do A-B tests or you can compare one time period to another time period and know what you're doing. Or you can even go out and um, find a, um, an audience of user testers who you can show to different designs that you have and see which of those is um, most likely to appeal to your visitors. So um, I think that is number one. And number two, you can't do this in isolation. So you've got to be good at sharing what you're doing, what your insights are, what your wins are, what your saves are, which is if you find out that a new design was going to significantly reduce your long-term value, um, then thank goodness you tested it and found out it doesn't work because otherwise you would have launched that thing and never realized it was it was a, a cancer in your business. Yeah. Um, so I think those are the two most the, the two hurdles that people need to get over: getting comfortable with the data, um, getting comfortable with the the data that Reveal pro, pro, uh, provides, and how you turn once Reveal has told you which of your visitors are likely to buy or likely to leave um how do you create an experiment that tells you what you should do to prevent those leavers from leaving and to reward those buyers for buying so that they come back more and more often yeah um understand the tools and uh, make sure that the whole organization is on board I, I think those are the two most important things yeah brian you you've said something about these uh, loyalty programs i i know for a fact uh, that Many companies are are crafting these loyalty loyalty programs. Uh, what I've discovered by working uh, together with uh, with a company that crafted the loyalty program in order to increase the customer lifetime value is that one uh, one step which is completely neglected is uh, the the feedback from the from a sample size of good customers. So if you if you apply RFM segmentation, for instance, you could get your VIP customers, your loyal customers, your uh, about to dump you customers, and so on. But if you do the math and if you identify, as you've said, the elasticity of the benefits that you could give is much more higher. So if you uh, decide to have a paid membership program for your best customers, my suggestion is to validate with a sample of, I don't know, 1000 customers that you are surveying upfront, give, validating that the benefits that you are going to provide to your customers are the, the, the right ones. So I, I think this iterative process, it's, uh, it's somehow neglected because many companies are just giving, okay, let's give these benefits and let's charge, I don't know, $40 a year or whatever they are charging for, for that, uh, those uh, subscriptions. And uh, I think you, you, you nail it completely when you said that you have to be uh, comfortable with the, uh, with the data and with the statistics as well. But uh, you, you've just mentioned it and I wanna unpack this to, to align the company around it because this is, I think it's, uh, 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 this is the elephant in the room. Uh, many people, uh, many leaders within the organization think that they know who's the customer, think that they, they, they have this, uh, it, it was that uh, image, if you recall, the, the duck rabbit illusion, you know, it's a duck or it's a rabbit. So mm -hmm. same, same painting, same image and different, uh, different animals in the minds of the, uh, of the viewers. I think that's happening uh, from, uh, with the leaders from uh, most of the companies and they think they know better because I don't know, the CX person, uh, things they know that uh, this is the customer while the product person thinks that that is the customer and that's what the, uh, what they need. How do you, let's say, bring peace within an organization which is trying to become customer centric and to, to, to come up with the program to increase customer lifetime value? What is, what is your suggestion? Uh, I, I, you know, I think well-timed feedback <laughs> is really important. So on the acquisition side, um, for um, almost all of our customers, we have a pop-up on the receipt page. So like an e-commerce site. Yeah. Um, 
somebody buys, they get to the receipt page, the thank you page, and we like to pop up a, um, a questionnaire that simply says, what almost kept you from buying today? And um, because it's on the thank you page, we get a high completion rate, thanks to the endowment effect. Yeah. And um, we get it from people who've just been through the process. So whether it's the first time they've bought from us or one of the subsequent times, we're getting it at that moment. So it's fantastic feedback. Um, what we are not as good at, and I think your point is well made, is on the um, using that existing customer list as um, a, a query engine. So to your example, our loyalty program, should it be free shipping? Should it be free returns? Should it be discounts? Should it be um, uh, free products? Do they want point systems? You know what? You know their number of options are amazing. Um, asking them that, and I think how you ask is really important. So um, you know, I get a lot of Net Promoter Score requests in my inbox, and I I don't. I mean, it's a good metric, but it's not a uh, it's not a it's not helpful feedback. So there's a lot of companies that are measuring themselves just to make sure that they're doing a good job, but the most innovative companies are going to find ways of surveying these key customers, the, the oil customers, or even usually you will not get as, as high a response rate from um, uh, customers that aren't buying as frequently, that aren't as uh, you know brand oriented. Um, so I might just be circling back and telling you that I, I, I think it's a huge missed opportunity to ask your customers what you should be doing um, and ask it, you know, an experimenter has to be able to ask it in a way, you know, if you go to a customer and you say, would you like free shipping or would you like free returns? Then they're going to give you whatever their answer is in the moment. It's probably going to be free shipping. Yeah. But if you ask them questions like, um, have you ever returned a product? What were the obstacles to that product? Um, and would you buy more if, if the return process had been easier? Something like that, where you're circling around to understand that value. And, and again, this is these are the skills of an experimenter, the skills of someone who knows how to write good surveys and user research. That's right. Uh, Brian, I have to challenge you a bit with, uh, uh, with the NPS part because I... Uh, uh, I do know for a fact that NPS is being uh, misused, let's say. Many companies are just using NPS without segmenting the, the responses. And that's, that's an average. I mean, it's like bounce rate, you know? I, I think aggregated data is simply crap, you know? Because you, you, it, what's the use of using a bounce rate or looking at the average conversion rate per website? It, what can you do about it? However, if you drill down into the data, and if you look at the bounce rate by traffic channel, by geography, by category of the product, that's a different thing because you can compare apples to apples. And that the same goes with the NPS as well. Many companies are looking at the NPS and it's like, I don't know, 68, 69 is like, okay, the patient is alive, but what's behind this? Where are the detractors coming from? Do we have more detractors in Pennsylvania than we have in, uh, I don't know, in Austin, where you are. Or, and once you look at those things, then you can look back and you can analyze so that you can find anomalies into data. And that's why I, I personally love NPS once it's segmented. So I think segmenting NPS by the category of products, uh, segmenting NPS by the geography, segmenting NPS by, uh, with the NLP, you know, looking at the actual responses, like what caused you to say, to, to give us this rating, like, because unpacking this is the job of the uh, optimizer as well. However, many companies, as I presume you, 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 you've seen this as well, are just Having NPS is like a checkbox. Okay, we are tracking NPS. So what? <laughs> Do something about it. Leverage it, improve it. Because at the end of the day, not improving based on the feedback that you're getting, it's simply uh, like, like you're, you're, you're getting the feedback. You're, you're being diagnosed by thousands of customers of yours and you don't do anything about it. It's actually at some point, it's even worse to collect NPS. Imagine this, you know, what was your experience with us today? What are the chances to recommend us to a friend? Zero. And then 
Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. The company does, doesn't do anything about it. Well, I think this underscores why today is the best day for someone to begin to get comfortable with these skills because I've, I've never done a segmented NPS analysis. Um, our clients say, yes, our NPS is good. And we say, okay, we hit that checkbox. Now let's go back to optimizing for these acquisition um, cat, these acquisition metrics. Um, so even I have to learn, I have, I have stuff to learn and I always will, which is why I love this, this particular field. But uh, if you're relatively new to the understanding of data and the, the, the ways to analyze things, start today because there's always something more to learn. Yeah, that, there's always something more to learn. Brian, what's your, uh, what's your take on uh, the, uh, let's say, not tips or tricks or insights, but what are your, uh, your, your favorite uh, ideas or let's, let's, build, let's build it like a list, you know, and let's, let's turn this into an article because I have all this team over here. We've, we've turned ourselves into a small media production company and uh, they are waiting for, for uh, they, they actually uh, always tell me to do something so that they can repurpose the, 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 the content. So let's come up with, I don't know, 10 ways, the 10 ways to increase customer lifetime value for e-commerce brands. You are first and then I'm next and then let's, let's, let's do it like this. All right. Well, the first one, the first one is the, is one of the hardest ones. The one that gets ignored is know your customer lifetime value and be able to measure it on a monthly basis. And if you can do it on a segment by segment basis, you're, you, you get two gold stars, but just helping our uh, customers come up with a some sort of a model that allows them to calculate uh, their long-term or lifetime value is, uh, I'm surprised at how few understand that number and it's so key. Yeah, perfection. So you can't improve what you don't measure, right? So exactly. Uh, like, or, or I had, a, I had a, a guy in our sales team, which always uh, had, had some, like a banner in front of him. It's uh, if you don't have a target, you'll uh, hit it every time. <laughs> Print it out. Okay, so my, uh, my next, uh, my, uh, my second way to improve custom lifetime value for e-commerce brands is to uh, listen to their... Uh, uh, best customers, you know, I mean, there are some customers which against all odds, you know, against all the obstacles that the companies are putting in front of them, they keep on buying, you know, it's like they are dodging all these obstacles and eventually they buy over and over and over again. These are the golden goose customers. We call them the soulmates. You can find them. In, and then you simply go out there and ask them what caused them to buy, I don't know, more than five times for, for, for the brand. It's such an easy, it's such a cheap way to, to, to unveil and to understand the, the, how they are articulating in their heads with their words, why they are buying from, uh, from your brand and from your e-commerce company. And once you know that, then you can use this to acquire better customers because you know it's like uh, if you acquire better customers, then they will, come back and buy again. And B, you can understand what kind of uh, onboarding and remarketing and uh, retention flows can you can you activate because you know from, from your best customers what makes them, what caused them to, to come back and, uh, and buy again. Yeah, okay, great. Um, the third one for me, I think, is take that value and apply it to the post-purchase world. So... Um, you need to understand how your customer segment is behaving. So if you can, if you can get a tool like Reveal and drop that in and understand on segment by segment basis what's going on, fantastic. Um, but at the very least, you need to be able to, to calculate things like your revenue per recipient on your, the emails that you're sending out and the equivalent on uh, if you're using SMS texting. Um, if you are using retargeting on your existing customers or um, uh, reaching out through advertising through the search engines and Facebook and what, Instagram and whatnot um, to existing customers, you need to understand those 
those moving parts because these are the knobs that you're going to be turning as you do everything from change your email to any changes that you make to your loyalty program or um, when you have a discount, how does it disproportionately affect your um, your um, uh, your best customers, that best segment versus the other customers? Um, you might find that if you have a 10% discount, it affects those um, great customers inordinately um, versus 15% doesn't help much. All it does is, is reduce the price. So you can really begin to find out what sorts of things you can do to, to increase lifetime value, long-term value. Perfect. Brian, I think the fourth one, uh, it's, uh, it's to use uh, what, it's, uh, what it's called ADBT, average days between the transaction, which is uh, uh, allowing marketers to understand when they should be triggering the uh, the next purchase uh, moment, you know, when they should be following up to customers, when is the re replenishing moment? Because if you sell coffee, it's different than if you sell clothes or if you sell, I don't know, uh, uh, do-it-yourself tools or home and garden things. So by understanding the purchase cycle and simply when to, to, to trigger the, the, the next uh, message to, to uh, activates uh, customers' willingness to buy again. It's it's such a, an easy thing to do because what, for instance, email marketers are doing is every week because that's what they have in their agendas. Every week they do like a follow up and they are intoxicating com customers with their follow ups. But maybe the purchase cycle is every two months. So why should you be giving them a discount code when they haven't used the product? Right, I'm, bu I'm buying uh, some supplements from a company. They have a subscription, that's great. Every month I bought uh, like these cans of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, matcha powder and all these things that uh, I'm uh, having here at the office for everyone to buy. Some, some of them are, uh, are very, very good. Some of them are not that good, but I've activated this subscription one month, two months. And then at some moment we've started to pile up those things, but they kept on, on, on sending them without knowing if we are actually consuming them. Uh, those so guess what we stopped the subscription and we 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 were pissed off because eventually that company were was not uh, aligning the subscription and the follow-up emails with our consumption right and they haven't even bothered to ask us maybe you consume it every two months or every three months or reactivate it push this button to to buy again from us you know it's simply push this button and we will uh, uh, we will send you the next uh, the next uh, product, and that's a pity because their products were actually good. But now we are frustrated because we have all these cans over there, and we are we're not uh, feeling like we need more. You know, we are not even consuming as we used to consume because we have this bad uh, feeling about uh, their products. I like that one. What number are we on? Five. Five. Yeah. Five. Um, have regular meetings with your customer service people. Um, so the, the salespeople and customer service people generally have a memory that's about seven days. Um, <laughs> so you, which is not a bad thing, but they're going to, you know, we're all humans. And so they're dealing with a lot of issues and they're going to remember, um, you know, the biggest deals that happened, you know, this year the biggest issues they had this year. Um, but on a general basis, the, the the little things that are interesting and helpful, they're going to remember for like seven days. So you meet with them more regularly to begin to understand what sorts of answer, questions they're answering, um, what sorts of complaints they're getting, um, where some where opportunities are for you to build out your, your product. And the product is not just the product you're selling, but also the, the service that you put behind it. I love this. Uh, that was unexpected, and I, I think that's uh, that's actually uh, a great one. Uh, let me tell you a story about uh, a customer of ours. They uh, they are from Belgium, I think, and they 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 are selling uh, a low value product, so it's like something like forty five dollars. The the average order value is around forty five dollars, 
and uh, they they wanted to be very close to their their customers so what they've done was they hired people from mozambique which they uh, they are talking french over there right so this customer they are in belgium but the salaries are so low that they could afford to actually call every customer once they purchased you know and it was such a uh, such a concierge service for such a small product. They were selling vegan stuff, you know, like vegan uh, vegan food, and it uh, that that dramatically increased their uh, their customer lifetime value by giving such a I don't know concierge uh, service for such a low 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 value product because the the customers were, were feeling like they actually care about it. And out of uh, I know a statistic about it. 68% of the customers which are leaving a company, they do it because they feel like the company don't care about them. And at the end of the day, don't care. Uh, it's very important, you know, if you feel like someone is not caring about you, why should you do it for, for them? So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that, that's uh, an And what's striking is, is even people that sell high dollar items where they could easily afford, no matter what yeah. the salaries are, easily afford to follow up and call don't. Um, I, um, I especially think of like nonprofits uh, staying in touch with their donors and things like that. There's a segment of people that don't want to call, yeah. but you'll generally find it's much smaller than the people that are like, wow, that, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I've told you this, uh, this story, but uh, back in 2011, I have sent something like 3,000 birthday cakes to our uh, customers in December. Did you really? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we actually made a deal with the cake shop. They, they were so crappy, you know, they, they looked awful because we, were, we, we weren't negotiating on the right, uh, right way. They, so they showed us the, the, the sample was looking way better than the actual cake. And they thought that we are not going to, to ship them and they will ship them for us. But eventually, anyways, we, we shipped them to our customers. We were selling car insurance and we know the birthday for all of, all of our customers. I've personally shipped something like 120 of those. It took me a week, but it was fantastic. I mean, we, we, uh, we, our NPS went through the roof. So it was 91 one, uh, after being 68 before that. And uh, also the amplification was fantastic after that because people were so surprised. We were selling cheap car insurance MTPL, who, who does that? I mean, who's giving such an attention to customers that bought, I don't know, on car insurance six months or two months from, from a company? Nobody does that. So it, it was, but we were calculating how, how much is the cost per uh, customer acquisition cost and how much is the reactivation cost and the, the ads and against how much is a birthday cake. And we, we made it. I mean, looking back, it was such an... Uh, such a crazy project, but it uh, went well for us eventually. The ROAS was there. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. So we are at uh, what? Uh, I lost the train of thought here. I think we are number at six. Number, number six. So I, I need to say something. I, I've talked so much and I haven't said number six. Okay. So uh, number six, if you want to increase customer lifetime value in e-commerce, I suggest you to apply RFM segmentation, which means recency, frequency, and monetary value. You segment your customers based on that, then you'll have so many surprises. Like, uh, you know, the Pareto's law 2080, it's applying, guess what, in e-commerce as well. So 20% of your margin is coming from 80% of your customers and vice versa. With the RFM, you will uh, manage to understand that you have uh, your best customers, your soulmates, you have uh, lovers, you have uh, new passion, like customers with a high recency, low frequency by high monetary value. So these are the potential lovers for, uh, for the future. So knowing your RFM segments will allow you and will empower you to come up with the treatment, which is taking into account the value of the customer. So instead of having a one size fits all approach to all of your customers, you can do like a concierge approach to your, your best customers. And I have an example here, one of our first customers that, that uh, was so crazy to, to believe in our dream of building uh, uh, OmniConvert Reveal. It's uh, uh, an office supply company. They, uh, they've applied RFM 
because they, they were selling to individuals and to companies as well. And they realized that, hey, the, uh, a company has a, a lifetime value, which is eight times more than uh, an individual. So they've uh, applied RFM and then they've connected with their order management system and they've put like, something like a red line. When, when you have a new order coming from a, a soulmate, which were their best customers, their, their, the companies, they've been alerted and their customer service, they had an SLA of five minutes to call that customer. So that dramatically improved the, uh, the NPS and also the uh, customer lifetime value for, for, for them. So, uh, yep, Brian, you're up next, number seven. To increase customer lifetime value, raise your prices. So once you, once you know the value, long-term value of your clients, you're going to find that there's these segments that, are, that have a low long-term value. And if you raise your prices, you're um, very likely to get acquire fewer of those. But with the higher profit margins that you have and understanding, uh, being able to use those profit margins to better serve your, um, your best clients, your highest long-term value clients, um, you're actually going to be able to um, grow your business and, and, and grow your profitability. So I think, um, first of all, there's, there is an increase in price that will not affect your acquisition. And, um, uh, you know, I, we have a, those customers that have the best brand value and the best long-term value and have things like these uh, loyalty programs we've been talking about are generally squarely in the position of, yes, our prices are higher than you can find on Amazon, um, but people, um, people love our selection. They love that we have all of this training material. They love that we have people ready to help them by email. You know, they're, they're getting the value out of their, uh, the, the work they're doing on their brand and it keeps building on itself. So consider raising your prices. Love it. It's uh, one of the best dominant numbers that you can use to, to, to increase. And it's so, so easy to, to do it. You know, it's not like so high to hard to increase your uh, prices. Number eight from my end is uh, to build, uh, uh, let's say, way to help your customers make progress with your products. So once you know why the customers are buying your products, you, you can also find out through research, for instance, through, through jobs to be done research, you can find out why the customers said, today is the day that I'm going to buy this product again. So once you know that, you will be in a position not to bombard customers with discount because that's only going to increase their ability to buy the product, not the motivation to buy the product. So once you know that, you can help customers make uh, progress by uh, adding things to educate, to document, to, to, with other ways to, to make progress than your, your product. So if they feel like they are making progress with the product that you're selling, they will more likely come back to buy again. One example here, one of the customers that we uh, uh, are using our technology, they are selling uh, uh, turmeric shots. So they've discovered that cost, the, their best customers, their, the customers with the highest customer lifetime value are not that young. And they are buying the turmeric shots, not to do sport and have more energy, but because of the uh, 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 pains that they have in their, uh, with, with their, uh, um, in their joints. So what they are now doing, they are having a brochure helping customers to get rid of pain with other ways than the turmeric shots. So every, at every new order, there's another way to get rid of the ankle pain, but they are doing this by collecting the zero party data and knowing that they are buying the turmeric shots because of this uh, uh, job to be done. I like that one. That was gonna be mine as well. The, um, um... I'm going to, I'm going to recast. So we're at what? Number eight, number eight, number eight. Yeah. Number, no, number nine. nine. You are, no, you are number at nine, number nine. nine. Yeah. Number nine. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of double down on that and, and um, uh, say that in each of the, this is especially for catalog e-commerce companies in each of the, the categories that you sell parts, you need to be the complete solution. Um, so one of the best, 
online experiences that I ever had and something that I continue to use as a model is a company called Crutchfield and they sell speakers for automobiles. So they sell the speakers and the big problem with selling speakers is how do you install them, right? Because it's very expensive. You can go to a shop and pay someone to install them for you. So they have to have um, for each of these speakers, for each of these cars, videos about how to install them. They've got to have the right tools for prying the doors off so that you can do those. They have to sell the complete kits and the information and they do a spectacular job of giving uh, any car owner everything that they need. So um, take, I'm, I'm stealing from number eight and I'm saying, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, you know, we work with a premium hot rod auto parts company. We work with a um, guitar building, do it yourself company. And these are, these are both companies in which not only are they buying the products, but the, the, there's an opportunity to build brand and long-term value around your ability to support the people using that. So it's onboarding on steroids. Um, you're that. building a mini YouTube around <laughs> um, your products. You are building a mini um, social network around your products to help people use them properly. So I hope I'm not just repeating what you said, but. Yeah. I, I love that, and it's uh, it, it's with a twist because uh, uh, you this this way to orchestrate different uh, different purchases down the line. It's uh, it's a bit different than uh, the previous one. Number ten, because we're uh, coming to the end of our session today, Brian, is to work with talented people. I think customer lifetime value optimization. It's something. Uh, crucial to the growth of any company and you need to work with the, the right people. So if you, uh, if you neglect this aspect, you will try to do it yourself, but it's uh, not o- always about do it yourself. So you, you need to write to work with the, the right consultant and with the right agencies. Brian, you're one of them. Where can people reach out to you if, uh, if they need help with their uh, customer value optimization or with, with their uh, conversion rate optimization? Uh, if you want to get on the phone with me and um, have me take a look at your site and um, help you come up with a strategy for increasing customer lifetime value, come to conversionsciences.com. Um, if we've done a good job, you'll have no problem uh, finding a way to sign up for a free consultation. And we've also got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles um, uh, on the tactics and techniques for uh, doing that as well. So. Perfect. So we can, uh, in terms of the social media, where where are you mostly active, the brand? Is it Twitter or is it LinkedIn? Uh, for me, uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Perfection. Same here. <laughs> uh, Elon Musk hasn't convinced me yet to, to migrate to, to Twitter. I still think that it's a mess and it's a chaos and I'm not getting anything out of that social media. There it is. I, I've said it. Perfect. So, Brian, thanks a lot for uh, being part of uh, CVO Live episode today. Uh, I have a question for you, a last question for you. We are planning a CLV revolution in autumn, so we are going to build a, a great event around it. Uh, let us know if uh, you, you will be part of it as well. I'll be there. Absolutely. Perfection. Great. So that's a wrap for today. Thanks uh, everyone for watching and we'll see each other in the next episode. Until then, uh, keep the value going.